The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. IELTS practice. Questions 1 to 6. You will hear a telephone conversation about studying abroad. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, admissions guidance. How can I help? Hello, I'd like some information about studying at your university. Can you help me? Yes, of course. What course are you interested in applying for? International business. I already have a first degree from a university in my country. Fine. So you'd want to do a master's level course? Yes, that's right. OK. We offer an MIB course. That's a 12-month full-time course. I can send you details of that course, or you can download a PDF file from our website. Could you put it in the post, please? I don't have access to the internet at the moment. Could you tell me what qualifications I need for that course? Yes, for the MIB, you need a first degree. The minimum qualification is a 2-1 or a first. OK. And in English language, you need a score of 7 or above in IELTS. That's not a problem. I have a nine. That's fine. Could you tell me the course hours and the semester dates, please? Yes, there's a total of ten hours of lectures, seminars and tutorials a week. And there's an extended stay abroad at the beginning of the second semester. That involves spending a month at the national head office of a multinational corporation. OK. And the semester dates are... just a moment... OK, the first semester starts on the 27th of September and ends on the 22nd of January. And the second semester runs from the 7th of February to the 27th of May. Can you tell me a bit more about the actual course content? Well, I don't know much about the course personally. I'm an admissions officer, but I can read the course description for you if you like. If you need to know more about the academic side, you'll need to speak to the course tutor. Thanks. I'd be very grateful if you could tell me as much as possible now. I'll just read the main points. It involves the advanced study of international organisations, their management and their changing external context. Students develop their ability to apply knowledge and understanding of international business to complex issues, both systematically and creatively, to improve business practice. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, if you could give me your name and address, I'll have full details of postgraduate courses sent to you. OK. My name is Javid Iqbal. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. OK. My name is Javed Iqbal. That's J-A-V-E-D-I-Q-B-A-L. Thank you. And your home address, Mr Iqbal? It's Aga Khan Road, Shalimar 5, Islamabad, Pakistan. Thank you. And could I ask you one or two more questions for our records? Yes, of course. What was your first degree in? I did economics. I got a first-class degree. And where did you study? At the university here in Islamabad. OK. Now, you said you had an IELTS level 9. Could I ask what your first language is? Actually, I'm bilingual in Urdu and English. Thank you very much. I'll put full details in the post today. Thank you. And thanks for all the information. Not at all, Mr Iqbal. Thank you for calling.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. The Airbus A380 is a revolution in aircraft technology. Today, I have as my guest Mr. James Carr, who worked on the project. Mr. Carr, when did you start working on the Airbus A380? I started working on the A380 project at the beginning of 2003, about a year after the first real construction began although work on the plane began in 2000. Can you tell us something about the plane? It is the biggest passenger jet in the world, with a capacity of 550 to 600 seats. It is over 24 metres high and has a wingspan of around 80 metres. It has 20 wheels and weighs 421 tonnes without passengers, and has a range of 14,800 kilometres. What exactly did your job involve? Were you working on the fuselage? No, I was working on the wing assembly at Broughton in North Wales. The fuselage and tail fins were made in Germany and Spain, and the final assembly took place in Toulouse, France. My job was to work on the computer-controlled wing panel assembly machines. These wing panels are not just sheets of metal, but have reinforcing stringers, which are long pieces of metal running along their length. The stringers are needed for strength. For the A380, Airbus invested heavily in automated machinery to fit these. The wing panel assembly machines cost around $12 million each, and there are now six of them. The machines required control programs to operate them, which told them where to go and what to do. I was responsible for the control programs. How many people were working on the wing assembly? It involved around 1,000 people, but this was a small percentage of the total, and they weren't all working at Broughton. Before the wing assembly took place, the wing had to be designed. This required massive amounts of research. The wing must be strong enough, but the weight must be kept to a minimum for safe takeoff and landing. The takeoff speeds for large aircraft can exceed 330 kilometres per hour. What was the factory at West Broughton like? Very big. The part I worked in was as high as a six- or seven-storey building. On some days, there were clouds inside the main building. There were other buildings, offices and departments inside the main buildings. Workers used bicycles, trucks and vans to get around inside. The building is the size of six-and-a-half football pitches. How did you test the wing? The wings went through several tests to confirm design and stress predictions. For the new aircraft, we tested one set of wings to destruction to find the strength. In other words, we completely destroyed the wing. We used another set of wings for fatigue testing. Fatigue testing is where we move the wings up and down repeatedly over a long period to check that they perform well and that no cracks appear. There were also test aircraft that pilots flew to check flying performance, fuel economy, loading and safety. How did you feel when the first plane was finished? The A380 is the most significant commercial aerospace project in over 30 years, and so it was good to be involved with something so important. On the 27th of April 2005, we watched as the A380 test aircraft flew for the first time, 
and there was a real sense of achievement. Did you have any problems during the construction? We didn't attempt a project of this size without expecting some problems. The whole thing was a problem-solving challenge from start to finish. Nothing was predictable. For example, while we were developing the programs, the robots nearly put holes in the wrong place, and we had to start again. All these problems cost the company millions of dollars along the way. How much did the whole project cost? I would guess it cost around eight point four billion pounds, or twelve point six billion euros. Thanks for talking to us, Mr. Carl. Not at all. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Welcome to Eurostar International Customer Relations. For English, please press one. Thanks. Your call will now be placed in a queue and answered as soon as an agent becomes available. Which journey would you like to make? London to Paris, return. And、um, what is your date of travel, please? The twenty-first of March, coming back on the sixth of April. What time of day would you like to travel? Around midday is best for me. There is one departing at twelve o nine from Waterloo Station. Pardon? Could you repeat that, please? Twelve o nine. Nine minutes past twelve. Yes. Nine minutes past twelve, gets to Paris at fifteen fifty nine. Right. I need to check the times of the trains coming back as well on the sixth of April. The latest I can get back to Waterloo is nine fifteen p.m. What's the last one I could catch to get back by nine fifteen? How about if you arrive at twenty one fifty three? Is that okay? I think that would be too late because the last bus is at nine thirty. Could you give me the one before that, please? Yes, I'll give you that. Nineteen nineteen from Paris arrives London at twenty fifty four. Sorry, what time was that from Paris? Nineteen nineteen. Um, nineteen minutes past seven. Sorry, I'm getting a bit mixed up. Could you run that by me again? Yes, of course. The train departs from Paris at nineteen nineteen, and it arrives in London at twenty fifty four. Got that? That will be fine. I'll need two tickets. Can we get a discount with our ISIC student cards? Yes, of course. If you are under twenty six, you can get a discount, making the price fifty nine pounds for the round trip. I'm afraid I didn't quite catch that. Could you say it again? Fifty-nine pounds for each return ticket, subject to availability. All right. Well, please, could you book those now? Yes. How would you like to pay? I'll pay with my Visa card. Could you give me the name on the card and the number, please? The name is M Kumada, K U M A D A. The number is four nine two nine eight nine three five seven three two one. Can I repeat that back to you? M Kumada, four nine two nine eight nine three five seven three two one. That's correct. And what's the expiry date on the card? It's o seven o seven. O seven o seven. Thank you. That's fine. Would you like the tickets to be sent by post, or will you pick them up at the check-in at Waterloo? We'll pick them up at the check-in. Please remember to bring proof of your age with you when you travel. Just one more thing, please. I am from Japan, and my friend is Chinese. Do we need visas to travel in Europe? I'm afraid I don't know. 
you'll need to contact the embassies of the countries you're going to. All of them? Oh dear. Thank you for your call. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a lecture about studying history. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to begin this term's lectures with a discussion of the various sub-disciplines in history. Before I do that, though, can I refer you to the handout you picked up on the way in? It deals with two general topics. The first is, why study history? And the second is, what is history? Neither of these questions has an easy answer. In fact, people have been asking these questions for as long as history has been studied. However, as you are mostly new students to this subject, and we have some students of economics with us also, I feel you should have some background to these basic questions. Anyway, it's all in the handout. I might add that for me personally, the most important reason for studying history is that I find it exciting. Our ancestors can remain, if we want them to, a mystery a closed book, a blackness that we never see into, or we can come to know what motivated them and discover how that led to the world we live in today. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. You who have chosen to pursue the study of history are very fortunate. This is a time when we can talk not just about history, but histories. Traditionally, history was seen as one subject, and the subject matter was clear. It was about kings and queens and wars. Additionally, it was about states and empires, or groups of states. This is what we now call political history. The subtopics were the parts of the world, for example, the history of China or of France. History has moved on somewhat, and we can learn a lot about current views of history by looking at the proposed lecture topics in our leading universities. In fact, you'll see that even the simplest definition of history, that it is about what happened in the past, is up for grabs. Some of the more how shall I put it, progressive areas of study are as much about what should happen in the future. One example of this is the field of postmodern history. Likewise, feminist history looks at the past to make sure the future will be different, and it uses the past to assist in its efforts to make the future as it wants it to be. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes lie a range of areas of study which have developed over the modern period, replacing the traditional idea of political history. These are by now mostly well established. You can study social history or economic history. Social history asks about the ordinary people and their lives, not just their daily lives, but their contribution to changes in our society. Ordinary people have desires and wishes which they try to put into effect, and this has a massive effect on social development which was not fully understood in the traditional study of history. 
By the way, one area of traditional history which I forgot to mention, but which has had a resurgence of interest in recent years, is the area of military history. This was, of course, of great practical use in more violent times, and unfortunately has become of increasing use and interest, academically and practically, in our own times. By the way, there is a new series of lectures on military history in our department, as if to demonstrate the truth of what I've just said. Ethnic and multicultural history are further examples of kinds of history which, like social history, differ from the traditional forms. Ethnic history is a modern concern which concentrates on the value systems and beliefs of a people, usually a minority people, which were ignored in the rapid forward march of the rich and powerful nations and states. How various ethnic groups live together and how their traditions change and develop is the subject of its contemporary cousin, multicultural history. In sum, as I said, you are fortunate to have such a wide choice of things to study in the fields of history. Choose wisely. And finally, it only remains for me to wish you good luck in your studies. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. For my projects, I chose to look at a subject which has interested me for a long time. Why is it that some people are much happier than others? More upbeat and optimistic. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my projects, I chose to look at a subject which has interested me for a long time. Why is it that some people are much happier than others? More upbeat and optimistic. I should say that I regard myself as a very happy person, and so are most of my family, as far as I know. <laughs> but that wasn't the reason why I chose this project. Some people think that nowadays we're becoming more depressed than we used to be, but I'm not convinced by that. And I came across some interesting research which tries to look at the subject from a positive point of view. It emerged from a movement called the Science of Wellbeing. And I decided I wanted to investigate it for my project because it involves several different types of factors. It can be viewed not just from the mental or physical side, but also from the social perspective. Now, in a large scale study of several thousand people of different ages, researchers found three main characteristics which appeared again and again in people who identified themselves as happy. The most significant factor was that you don't have to be someone who does something brilliant, uh, discovers penicillin or composes a symphony, for example. But happy people do seem to know what their strengths are. This enables them to make the best of themselves and not to dwell on what they're doing badly. 
Another striking finding was that happy people tend to be very curious, not about family gossip or things like that, but about larger issues like current events. I remember one person the researchers interviewed had never learned to read, but he was happy because he kept up through TV news. And then, and this surprised me, people don't have to have lots of friends to be happy. But they do have to be able to appreciate what they do have, the good fortune they've had, and how different their lives could have been if they hadn't been so fortunate. Turning now to what the research says should be avoided if people are going to stay happy, the three things that stand out are as follows. First of all, reflection time on your own is good. But not if people use that time regretting mistakes and blaming themselves for everything. Another point is that people shouldn't worry about getting angry sometimes. It's part of what makes us human, and it can be healthy. But they shouldn't always try to find fault with others. This leads to a great deal of negativity. And the final thing which should be avoided if a person is going to be happy is always trying to compete. Of course, it can be fun to try to beat another person in a game, but not if this becomes your only aim. It's much better to enjoy taking part in the game rather than being obsessive about winning it. Now, I've tried to do a lot of reading on the subject of well-being research, and I have to say, it does have its critics. It's widely accepted that this positive approach does help us understand what happiness is and why some people are very unhappy. However, this has been dealt with many times before. The critics basically say that it's the old science under a new name, with only very small changes in approach. Well, that might be the case. It may bring us very little closer to finding out exactly how our brains work. But I think that sometimes even a very small change in perspective can bring real and long-lasting benefits. Above all, I feel that well-being research might help us to move away from simply prescribing drugs for depression. It helps us to explore alternative ways of dealing with unhappiness. I'd like to finish my short presentation by mentioning one of the people who was interviewed by the research team. Ada Clark is exactly 100 years old and still going strong, still giving piano recitals in her local town. She regards herself as a very happy person, and that this positive spirit has kept her healthy over her long life. But the reason I'm mentioning her now is because not one of the factors she says makes her happy is on the list I mentioned before. Every human life is unique. And we cannot guarantee what will make each one of us happy. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.